everyone. I'm glad to join you here in Campo Grande and to keep on working on some of the debates that have been fostered by the project so far. So thank you for having me as well as for hosting this. And the title of my presentation today is Audiovisual Literacy Across Real, Real Worlds, Unlearning Through Recent Indigenous Focused Films in Brazil. Let me start by inviting you to picture the real world of a monolingual, monocultural, and monological land, some call Brazil. Machines harvest thousands of metric tons of soybean for the sake of our booming economy. Sugarcane fields stretch to the horizon, for we need more ethanol. Dozens of thousands of cattle get butchered every day, for the demand for meat is ever increasing. All for the greater good, for the greater number. It's just another day in the republic of soycracy, canecracy, and cowcracy. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the only way it could be. Progress must prevail for sufficiency is not, not enough. We need more. During Brazil's military dictatorship, laws significantly curtailed indigenous rights and self-determination. But after democratization, the 1988 constitution established strong legal protection of indigenous people's rights, including the establishment of official demarcation of lands, assigning those people's permanent possession exclusive use of threat of such territories. Now we are on the verge of losing a great deal of what we have achieved with the 1988 Constitution when it comes to the rights of indigenous peoples. The main concern being that Dilma's administration is shifting responsibility for land demarcation from the National Indian Foundation, FUNAI, which represents indigenous peoples here, to other government bodies, such as the Congress and the Agriculture Ministry, which are closer to the large land owners' interests, to the interests of our Congressional Rural Caucus, known in the country as Bancada Ruralista. From the perspective of educational policies, this is quite a paradoxical and ironic scenario since, on the one hand, the teaching of indigenous history and culture was made compulsory in Brazil, uh, in Brazilian schools in uh, 2008, but in the, on the other hand, Dilma's administration, by pushing agribusiness lobby forward, is constantly reminding us that indigenous worlds are not the real ones and that this world, the world of agribusiness, this is the real world. This reminds me of what Isabel Stonguet and Philippe Pignard called the infernal alternatives generated by neoliberal capitalism. In their 2005 book, Capitalist Sorcery, Stonguet and Pignard claimed that capitalism presents us with ensembles of situations that apparently leave no choice other than resignation. Situations which they call infernal alternatives, a tautologous and apparently inescapable vicious circle. For instance, the idea that indigenous fights for land are not valid because they imply the interruption of progress. Or, as Congressman Wilson Lito, one of Brazil's rural caucus, Bancada Ruralista, mm -hmm. said, if 100,000 rural producers invade Brasilia, there will be a civil war, and the government does not have the right to transform Brazil into an indigenous nation. It cannot be, at the same time, an Indian reserve and, a, and an agricultural power. End of quotation. So, how can we unlearn the tautologies of such a real world? 
let us turn our, our, our attention to the real world of the Tupi-speaking Yanomami living in the state of Horaima in the Northwest Amazon region. In March 2011, the highly experimental film Shapiri, which revolves around Yanomami shamanism, was filmed at the Watoriki Reserve during a meeting of 37 shamans. Shapiri is a Yanomami term that characterizes the shamans, male spirits, and also auxiliary spirits. As French ethnologist and Yanomami specialist Bruce Aubert puts it, the Shapiri are shields against illnesses sent by other human and non-human beings. They regulate the action of co cosmological forces that can affect the good functioning of the universe. And I now invite you to watch the very short trailer of Shapiri. bodily senses and conceptual frameworks in a way that might help one unlearn assumptions and expectations forged by national and developmentalist concerns. If large landowners are busy harvesting record-breaking soybean crops in the Rio Brazil, the Chapiri are even busier controlling the very real ferry of tempests the days and stations of the year, the abundance of game, the fertility of the forest. As the Yanomami shaman and well-known spokesperson David Kopenawa says, in the falling of the sky, words of a Yanomami shaman, the Shapiri are busy holding up the sky to prevent its falling. Another point is that Chapiri, the film, conveys no interest in creating an illusion of transparency. It doesn't just document or explain shamanism, it rather translates the dynamics of such practice through experimentation with the visible and invisible, the audible and inaudible. As the film's website says, it was designed to take into account two different notions of image those of the Yanomami and ours. It produces profound feelings of disorientation in the viewers, altering their corporeal awareness, almost as if it was possible to embark in a journey through different levels of the cosmos through the film. Building on some of the ideas Jessica and I have been exchanging about indigenous-focused media in Brazil and Canada, I would say that the viewer in this case is required to relinquish a position of semantic mastery so that the aesthetic and pedagogical experience of unlearning can take place. The viewer's involvement in this case is not primarily hermeneutic anymore. It is, and also trying on some of the ideas that Jessica and I have been exchanging, one of capture and affection. The authority of the watcher over the watched is constantly challenged. Now, the Amazon is indeed a very productive region when it comes to the proliferation of real worlds. And I'd like you to, to invite you to get to know something of the real world of the Carib-speaking Huikuru, who inhabit the upper reaches of the Xingu River in the Xingu National Reserve. 
em Mato Grosso. In 2011, the film Hyper Women was shot among them. And one of the filmmakers that you can see there in the picture is Takuma, who is a Kuikuru himself. And he joined forces with ethnologist Carlos Fausto and the filmmaker Leonardo Sete to produce it, this film. So last year, Hyper Women won the Best Documentary Award at the Vancouver Latin American Film Festival and will also show at the Montreal International Documentary Festival next November. The film follows preparations for the Jamburi Kumalo ritual, which means the hyper women ritual, uh, which is a ritual of singing and dancing that is only performed by women. However, the only woman who knows all the songs of the ritual is very sick. So the others, uh, young and old alike, help her in order to rehearse the ritual. Let's have a look at the trailer of that one too. who bring together both genders in themselves. And the film, as you saw, displays shirtless Kuikuru women. So last March, Facebook, which has a policy against the sharing of pornographic and explic explicitly sexual content, removed the pictures of the film from its database. And later on, a black stripe was used to cover the uh, breast and genitals of the this women by the film uh, production company and the pictures went online again. Ethnologist Carlos Fausto, who had worked on the film, contains that, and I quote, from the point of view of the Koikuru women, they were extremely well dressed. From the point of view of Facebook, this is pornography. They can only see nudity, which is the most banal thing in the world. End of quote. This makes us think about how Western preconceived notions of nudity refused their particular ways in which these women engage with clothing and perform their bodies. And it also relates to something Canadian art historian Ruth B. Phillips said about social media at the Future of Ethnographic Museums Conference in Oxford, England a few weeks ago. I quote her. Social media can be used as a genuinely democratizing force, providing a channel for a direct voice. 
but they can also be used to provide a smokescreen that gives an appearance of democratic consultation while masking the absence of collaboration and the loss of multivocality." End of quote. By pigeonholing the pictures of Kuikuru women as pornographic and explicitly sexual content, Facebook seems to be looking into the democratic greater good for the greater number, but it ultimately gives short shrift to multivocality. So, each in its own way, these two recent films addressing shamanism and ritual in indigenous South America facilitate dehomogenizing the stereotyped ways in which these people are portrayed in mainstream pro-developmentalism media, <coughs> exposing us to different regimes of truth. They engage us, as Brazilian ethnologist Eduardo Ribeiro de Castro would say, with different real worlds rather than imaginary ways of seeing the world. In different ways, they interrupt the univocality between what we and the other are saying, and this univocality uh, that leans towards what Viveiro de Castro called authoritarian centralism, one of the characteristics of Western cosmology that leads us to think, and I quote, that others merely have misguided versions of our reality, that we simply have to teach them how things are, how things really are, which would be something similar to running a police operation or providing them with ontological re-education. End of quote. To conclude, I would say that being captured or affected by different real worlds is very different from tolerating them. The idea of tolerance actually leads us to colonial condescendence. It leads us to disqualifying the specificity of other modes of being and knowing. It implies there is one reality and then true and untrue versions of it, the untrue versions being the ones that should be tolerated. One needs to take seriously the idea that the Shapiri, for instance, are not eccentric, irrelevant, and non-threatening. One needs to take seriously the idea that the hyper-women are not simply a metaphor or a belief, and that what some call nudity others conceive of as clothing. Engaging with forms of audiovisual literacy that interrupt the rush to teaching how things really are, that interrupt the rush to ontologically re-educate others, may also help us to tackle the difficult matter of unlearning infernal alternatives. Thank you.